Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're very glad that you're here for the first guest lecture of SciStar for this year. And uh, we have Dr. Thomas Hayworth here with us, who is a leader in astrophysics at Queen Mary since uh, 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yeah. And uh, he's also a Dorothy Hodgkin Fellow. And he's going to be talking about uh, planet formation instead of clusters, as you can see. Uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to him. And Hopefully you'll answer some of, the, some of the questions you may have afterwards as well. Yeah, so you massively um, encourage questions. Thank, thank you so much. Um, go on. Um, yeah, so um, this was fairly last minute arrangement. I was sort of, uh, um, I, I suggested I could do a talk on the James Webb Space Telescope and some new results, but I need lots of time. Or you could have something that's basically in my bag of talks I can give. Um, and so you're getting that, that latter one this time. Maybe, maybe James Webb Space Telescope another day. What you do have is a brand new demo that I've never tried before that's probably not going to work, but we'll, uh, there's, there's something new here that's not, not just pulled out of that. Um, so yes, this is going to be a talk about my main research area, which is uh, thinking about planet formation and how it depends about the bigger picture. Um, so before I get into that, I wanted to just start off by saying that SciStar really plays an important role. Um, we were just mentioning that for me, at least, coming back from campus, it kind of feels almost normal again. Um, you know, we've, been, we've been back for a couple of years, but it's, it's, I, I feel like there's not really been the sense of community and belonging, and there's been a fairly, I'd say, not optimal relationship between staff and students as well. There's quite a disconnect, I'd say. And I think SciStar can play a really important role in helping that. You know, we can come and give talks. We can, um, what, what, what was there pre-COVID but isn't anymore is we can go on trips together and uh, do social things together perhaps as well. For example, the uh, end of year hall, apparently, before I arrived, um, staff used to come along to that. So it'd be really good to uh, you know, rebuild our relationship uh, and not have sort of academics on one side and students on the other. You know, we um, want to talk to you and we want to help you and uh, it's hard to do that if, we, if you're worried about talking to us. So probably there's a bias here and most of the people in this room probably are already pretty active and engaged. But I um, you know, just want to say thank you, Sci Star, for all that you're doing, and, and yeah, let's maybe try and see how we can talk more between staff and the, and the society and the students, and sort of build up our relationship in the future. Um, also, just want to acknowledge that I'm kind of getting to a stage in my career now where I don't do that much. Actually, I go and give talks about stuff people working with me do. Um, so to give them proper acknowledgement, um, Lynn Chow is a PhD student working with me. She's nearly finished, actually. And, uh, this demo is to do with her work. Um, Gavin Coleman is a postdoc who's been here for years um, working with me. Um, Sebastian Payne has uh, he started in January of this year. Julia recently left the Globus to Imperial. So thank you to everyone here. Um, most of what I'm talking about is, is stuff that they have done. So let's get into the science a little bit. Um, the talk's called Planet Formation in Stellar Clusters. So um, planets are the starting point. So you're, you're probably aware that we now know of many more planets than, than the planets in the solar system. Right? We've now got more than 5,000 confirmed planets around stars other than the sun. And what's um, equally impressive and amazing is that those planets are really, really diverse in their properties. Okay? Um, and some of that diversity is illustrated here. So this is how massive the planet is compared to Jupiter. So for reference, there is Jupiter. Um, and then this is the orbital period, which is a proxy for how far the planet orbits the star. So close in, the planet orbits uh, relatively quickly, and further out it takes a long time. That's not the demo, don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, we've got um, close in planets, far out planets. Here's Mercury, the Earth, Jupiter, Uranus. So you can see there's, I often hear this referred to as a shotgun blast of planets above this line. And below this line, we may have not been looking long enough, or our telescopes aren't good enough to find planets. Um, so we get these things called hot Jupiters that are very massive and close in. They are about as massive as Jupiter and hot, as the name suggests. Um, as you go down in mass, you get um, terrestrial planets that are so hot that they're molten, so like Mustafar in Star Wars, if you like. Um, and then as you go out, we get uh, super Earths and uh, rocky planets, so planets that are sort of like the Earth but more massive, and then ocean worlds, ice giants, and, and the cold Jupiters. Um, so you'll notice that there's very little there like the planets of the solar system. Uh, we, we don't have lava worlds or hot Jupiters. 
we don't have super Earth, which are thought to be the most common kind of planet. So this is already sort of throwing questions at us of, you know, how, well, why are there lots of different types of planetary systems, and how does the solar system fit in? Um, just to illustrate, I'm sort of um, beating a dead horse now a little bit, but just to illustrate some more of the um, you know, diversity of planets. This is a, a movie that's going to show planetary systems discovered with the, with the TESS space telescope. So the, our solar system is here, um, there's the scale of our solar system for reference, and then this is going out away from the sun, these are different stars, and it's going to show the, the, the planets around the water team. So um, you'll notice that a lot of these planetary systems are much smaller than the, the solar system. That's just because of the way we find them. We find planets that are closer in a bit easier. Um, but you'll see even with that bias, we're finding some with just one planet, some with great many. We find some really big planets, some really small planets, really hot planets, really cold planets. Planets are really diverse. Yeah, sorry, the colour scale is the temperature. And the size of the blob is the size of the planet. And then this is hopefully the worst part I'll show you in this talk. Um, but again, just trying to illustrate some of this diversity. This is how massive the planet is, and this is how big it is. Here is the Earth, and all these points are planets where we, we can get the mass and the radius. So if it follows this line, it's sort of a bit like Earth composition. Um, but then you get some real oddballs like this thing. This thing's only twice as big as the Earth, but it's about 20 times more massive. How on Earth does that happen? You know, there's, there's all sorts of weird planet possible compositions, like this would be 100% water, world planet, and so on and so forth. So these, these things are really, really broad in their properties, these planets. So how to explain this, and, ha and, and how to understand how the solar system fits in? How do we understand planet diversity? So I would argue in order to understand how planets are so diverse, we need to understand how they form. What, what is it that makes planets, and how does that make them have a, a big range of properties? Well, when we look at young stars, uh, and um, in, in star-forming regions, we see that they have these flattened disks of material. Okay? Now, um, when I do this sort of pitch at schools and stuff, I show a movie of the solar system and, and uh, get people to tell me what's going on. Um, well, when you look at the solar system, the, the planets all orbit in a flat plane around the sun and all in the same direction, okay? So the planets don't go over the top of the sun, say. And so when you see a flattened disk that you can tell um, through the Doppler effect is rotating, this is the natural place to form planets. Okay, so here we've got one with a star in the middle like that, and here it's rotated like that, so you can actually see the star in this case. There's a, a baby star in there, and there's stuff left over from the, planet, from the star formation process is what's going to make our planets. And that's just the same thing here, but rotated. And these images were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope in like 1995, I think, something like that, maybe 1993. Um, and our view has improved since then. So these are all images taken with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, in the desert. And these are millimeter um, wavelength observations. They can really peer right into the disk. Um, so no longer do we see this sort of fuzzy um, like halo that we can't see through, we can look deep inside, and when we do, these things aren't smooth, they're full of rings and other structures. So this is looking at something called dust in the disks, which are little solids like grains of sand, and you can see that none of these are smooth. Um, this is uh, another image of the dust in a disk, and here, if you zoom in on this little box here, we can actually see a, a young planet. So we know for sure these disks are where the planets are made. Baby star, disk of material. In this case, the planet is quite big, so it's carved out a big gap and we can see it. And then these images are all just one disk, but um, looked at in lots of different um, types of gas. So here we're looking at the chemistry of the disk, so carbon monoxide, other things that I don't know the name of. We can actually start to see not just the, the solids that might go into making our planets, but also the gases that might make up their atmospheres. So we're really getting a fantastic view of these planet forming disks. So this, I've got to move this box out of the way. Um, this one on the, um, on the uh, left for you, this is only 2018. So this is all really recent stuff. Now, our view in the last um, 2021, so the last few years, five years, has massively improved of, of this planet forming disk. Right. So I'm going to stop there. Necessarily, we have to jump around a bit here, because this talk is about how planet formation and, and the planets you get is affected by the environment. 
So what have we seen so far? We've seen we've got loads of planets, and they're all really broad in their properties. And we've seen we've got these planet-forming disks, and we're, we're getting a really fantastic view of these. But I'm about to argue now, through hopefully a not too convoluted path, that these are weird. These are odd disks. You know, these are ones that are close to us that we have our best look at, and they're not normal. So they're not very good for understanding the planets we see. Yes? Is that disk there, is it near anything that we can relate to? Is it near anything recognizable? In terms of the solar system? Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't remember what the um, stellar properties are here. I mean, I think the star is probably going to be around solar mass. Yeah. And this planet's probably more massive than anything in the solar system. For sure. Yeah. And whereabouts is it? Uh, close. Okay. Um, I mean, we can quickly do a Google. This, uh, uh, yeah, let's say massively uh, encouraged questions. This system is PDF 70, um, and its distance. I mean, this will mean probably nothing. 110 parsecs away. So that's that's close. That's in our backyard. Um, so for reference, um, so so what I'm going to show here is uh, this really is a bit of a tangent, but we have a bunch of nearby star forming regions that are our favourite place to look for. Uh, Look at these planet forming disks. Um, why do we have a, a particular bunch of nearby star forming regions? Well, let's look at what happened um, 14 million years ago. There was a supernova going off here, and the sun is this thing that's drifting into the middle of the bubble. So let's just go back and start again. Um, so we've got a, a supernova going off, a star exploded, and the sun by chance is drifting into the middle of that bubble. And that supernova has crashed into some clouds of gas and made them form stars. So we've got all these. Um, star clusters that we, we happen just you know, fortuitously to sit at the middle of this bubble with all these neat little star clusters nearby. And it's in these young clusters where the, the planets are going to be being born. So Lupus is one of our favourites, um, Ophiuchus, Taurus is around here. These are where all of those disks from the previous slide are. Okay? And they're about 100, this is about 100 parsecs, right? Um, so um, this is where we look, this is where we see most of our, our um, planet forming disks. But I'm going to argue now that these are um, fairly odd starting regions. And the argument is that they're, they're quite small. They have a few hundred stars in. This is Taurus, one of the ones that was on that, the edge of that supernova bubble. Um, and that has a broader hundreds of stars. But we have other clusters in the sky that you can maybe even see now look a little bit different that have way more stars. Thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of stars. And what we're now going to see is they're quite different environments. So we focus on that end, but actually most stars end up forming at this end. So what I'm going to show now is a computer simulation by Matthew Bate from the University of Exeter of a cloud that's going to collapse under gravity to form some stars, like Taurus would have done. Um, so this is going to make a few hundred stars, say. And what he's got here is a computer code that has a description for how fluids move around, it has a description of gravity, he's got a big blob shaking it up and he's going to let it go and see what happens. Um, so it's turbulent, um, we see clouds in the Milky Way are turbulent, um, so this sort of messy structure. And gravity squishes it into filaments, so you'll, you'll see elongated yellow structures, yellow is denser. So these, these are what we call filaments, and you can see in a minute the stars will start popping out. So material is getting channeled down these filaments, and when they meet, they kick out a bunch of stars. So it starts off fairly slowly, but eventually the, the thing's going to be kicking up hundreds. So this is a, you know, a fairly nice model of, of star formation. Like we think um, this does a pretty good job of describing the kinds of stars we see when you have about 100 stars being formed. But, and this is where maybe it's getting a little bit technical, there's this thing called the initial mass function. If we go out with a telescope and look at a group of stars and count the number of stars at different masses, and then we look at a different cluster and do the same exercise, we always find the same answer. For every big star, there are way more small stars. Okay, you get tons of small stars, not so many middle stars, and very few big stars. And that's what this is called, the, the, this slope, is the, is the initial <coughs> function. So this is, and this is basically the, the fraction of stars you'd expect to get. So it, for every big one, you get way more low mass ones. And in that simulation I just showed you, this um, histogram is, is the model that's trying to reproduce this thing we observe. And it does a good job, right? It's really nicely reproducing the slope at least. 
but it doesn't really make anything bigger than like four or five times more massive than the sun. And that's the key thing that is missing, right? We're not, we're not getting any big stars in these simulations, we're not getting any big stars in Taurus. Um, so why do big stars matter? Um, so this is something I, I do in my, in my course, we, we do this exercise. So um, we, we ask a question, how does the, the brightness, the luminosity of one star that's 40 times more massive than the sun, compare it to 40 suns in the sky? So the, the exercise we're doing is, if I took the sun and copy pasted it in the sky 40 times, how bright would that be compared to taking all those stars and, going bleh, and making a big one? Yeah? Would they be the same brightness or would they be different? So you may or may not have come across uh, this equation before, but for a black body, um, the luminosity, the brightness is its area, and times the stefan boltzmann constant times how hot it is to the power of four. So if my star is a sphere, we can just say pi r squared, um, four pi r squared, sorry, um, sigma t to the four is how bright it is. Okay, well, let's have a look at how hot and how bright, uh, sorry, how, how hot and how big these stars are. Um, this one is um, about eight times bigger than the sun, say at about 40,000 Kelvin, and the sun would be about what, one solar radius and about five, 6,000 Kelvin. And if you plug that radius and that temperature into here and just compare the ratio, you get that this is about 3,700, you know, 4,000-ish times brighter than these. So com massive stars are way brighter than low-mass stars. But that's only part of the story. Because the light from massive stars actually does something else really well. Um, you may or may not have done some quantum mechanics yet, um, but in, in quantum mechanics, the uh, energy levels of an atom, like hydrogen, are represented by a ladder. In fact, I, I should have bought it. I have a book, Quantum Mechanics for Babies, that my, you know, my, my kids have, and it talks about the, the, the whole message there is um, an electron or, or a ball, as it says in that book. In quantum mechanics, can have this energy, or it can have that energy, or it can have that energy, um, but it can never sit between the two. So, a way of modeling the hydrogen atom and the energy states it has is with this ladder. So, the electron could be in this state, or this state, or this state, or this state. Okay, and so if I sent a photon, a packet of light at this um, atom, and it absorbed it, it might jump up, and then it would jump down again and emit another photon to, to conserve energy. But if I keep kicking this atom harder and harder and harder with, with you know, higher and higher energy light, eventually I'm going to. Um, give it such a big kick, it will pop off the top of the atom, and it'll be what we call ionized. So, um, if your wavelength of light for atomic hydrogen is less than 91.2 nanometers, you can do that. You can kick the electron off the atom. Um, so, this is what we call the Planck function. It tells you how bright a star is, or a black body is, at different wavelengths. And this black line here is that wavelength where you would be able to rip an electron off a hydrogen. Um, but before we look at this part anymore, actually, why would that be important? Well, um, if I have one particle that's uh, you know, a proton and an electron, a hydrogen atom, and it's whizzing around, that relates to the temperature. You know, if I warm the temperature up in this room, the particles move very more quickly. If I put more particles in, then it'll also be a higher temperature as well. Um, and uh, what you're doing when you take uh, a photon and um, ionize this atom, we have initially an energy that was just whatever the particle had, and afterwards that photon energy is getting turned into kinetic energy. So you now have two particles that are whizzing around faster than they were before, so this makes the temperature hotter than that. And so basically photons on this side of that line are really good at making gas hot. They're really good at ripping electrons off of hydrogen and making it hot. So our comparison of the sun with the, our 40 solar mass star again, this blue line is the sun, 40 suns is this orange line, and you can see that, yeah, they don't look like you know, amazing, oh sorry, let this step back, they, um, they're not like massively different looking to this, but on this side of the line, they're tremendously different, right? This is a log scale. The difference between there and there is what? Uh, something like 17 or 18 orders of magnitude. So these things, the sun doesn't really emit many photons that can rip electrons of atoms, but these things, they emit most of their light where, where they're, they're capable of doing this. So yeah, we said that the, the 40 solar mass star was about uh, 4,000 times brighter, but it's about 12 trillion times brighter when it comes to emitting this light that can ionize hydrogen. So let's see what that does to our movie. Um, we saw a movie a minute ago that will look a bit like this one, 
where the gas was collapsing and making stars. Um, and on the right, we're going to do the same thing, but when massive stars are formed, we're going to treat the fact that they will heat the surroundings by ionizing the gas. So they start off in an identical way, and in a minute you'll see massive stars have formed here and are growing, but they're blowing a great big bubble in the gas. They're making it go from 10 degrees Kelvin, 10 Kelvin, to 10,000 Kelvin. Okay, yeah, it's that big of an effect. So they, the bubble gets very hot, high pressure, and just pushes into the surroundings and, and blows away the gas. And this is a whole field in itself. I'm not really talking about this in, in detail today. Understanding what this means for um, for star formation. Awesome movie showing the power of massive stars and, and, and why they're important and why when we look at Taurus and Lupus and those nearby star forming regions that don't have them, we might be getting things a little bit wrong. Because the environment in here, this is 10,000 degrees Kelvin and full of ultraviolet light, is very different to the environment on the left. So, you know, I've said this basically, but we're focusing here when we look at discs, but actually most stars form in these big clusters. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but this is just illustrating this point. So the problem is we're, we're focusing on, on odd disks. So what happens to these disks in this harsh uh, environment, um, in, in this, this hot bubble where the, where the temperature's high and there's lots of ultraviolet radiation? Well, they stop looking like disks. So this is an artist's impression. Um, so in here, in the middle, we have a planet-forming disk, and over there on the right, you can see a massive star and that is shining on the disk and driving what looks like a cometary plume of material through it, right? So you can see the disk inside and the stuff streaming off of it. Um, so this isn't one of my simulations, this is just an artist's impression, unfortunately. But yeah, you can see it, it, there's something clearly significant happening to the disk. There was material streaming off of it. And we can do better than artist impressions. Um, we can actually see these cometary plumes. Now, um, maybe I'll, I'll close the slides and zoom in, in in a second. In fact, let's do that so you can really see. This is a new, actually not published yet, James Webb Space Telescope image of the center of the Orion Nebula Cluster. Um, this is a star called Theta 1 Ori C. Um, in fact, let's just go to the raw image since it's better quality. And you can see there's all these little things with tails. Here, 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 here. And if I move around a bit, there's some really big ones somewhere. Yeah, there's a big one. Yeah. So we, we don't just, this isn't just something I'm sort of plucking out the air. We don't just have artist impressions. We can actually see planet forming disks with, uh, you can actually even see the little dark disk there with stuff, with, with this cometary sort of cocoon around it. Okay, so when you take a planet forming disk and stick them in this harsh environment, um, something happens to them. And they're, they're losing material. And the, the basic idea, I wouldn't normally put this in an outreach talk, but you're all physics students. The basic idea of why this happens, so if you have a star of mass M star, and the whole thing is just at some uniform temperature, um, there is uh, material in this disk, or in this uh, out here, is moving around at some speed, which you call the sound speed. That's the average thermal motion. So in this room, uh, as we've already said, um, the, the sound speed um, is, is related to the temperature, right? As we warm things up, the particles will move around faster in this room. So as we warm up our temperature, eventually, um, it could get hot enough that particles just moving around like they are in this room actually exceed the escape velocity. You know, if I throw a ball up, um, it will fall back down. But if I throw it hard enough, it will go into orbit or into space, yeah? That's the exceeding the escape velocity. The same thing happens here. There's just gas sloshing around, and eventually, if it gets hot enough, or if you, if you get far enough away, that will actually just escape, just from its normal sloshing about. And so, when you um, compare the, rate, uh, the, the escape velocity you need to, to not be attached to that star anymore, with the sound speed, you get this expression, which is called the gravitational radius. So it depends on how massive the star is and then how hot things are, because this, this is the sound speed, which sound speed squared is related to the temperature. So the whole idea of this process is that I shine some harsh light on the disk, I, or so first of all, sorry, let's just say if you make it big enough, you lose mass. The idea of this environmental effect is that if you shine light on the disk, you warm it up, this gets bigger, yeah, the sound speed goes up because it's hotter, 
and particles move around faster, so you can take a disk that was stable and would have like, kept all its mass, and you can make it lose mass, you know, just because particles moving around are unbound. Um, right, so we can see, there's a few technical slides here, uh, I'll try and go through them slowly. Um, we can see individual evaporating disks, we can see those cometary uh, shapes. You know, no, no one's going to argue that this thing is, a, is something extreme is happening to this disk here, right? There's stuff just pouring off of it. Um, but we can go beyond that and also look in a sort of statistical way at how environment affects um, the disks. So what this plot is doing is trying to show that the um, age, or sorry, the lifetime of these disks, how long they have to make planets, actually depends on how harsh their environment is, how, much, uh, how many massive stars are nearby. So the exercise here is you look at lots of different groups of stars in the sky, and you say, well, how many of the, the stars actually still have a disk? How, how many of them are still capable of making planets? And you do that for clusters of lots of different ages, and you, you get a plot like this. So early on, at uh, low ages, most of the, the stars in a cluster are capable of making planets, they have a disk. And then over time, those disks get destroyed and the fraction of stars with disks gets lower and lower and lower. So the key point here is that um, the green line is for clusters that are really massive with lots of massive stars. So when you have lots of massive stars, the fraction of stars with, with a disk at any given time goes down. Okay? So this is evidence in a statistical way, just by counting stars and disks, that um, when you um, put, put a planet forming disk in a horrible environment that, that strips this material from it, that you, you make the disk with less time. And it, it's not like conceptually hard, right? If you're taking a pool of material and, just, and taking stuff off of it, it isn't going to live as long. Um, and then this is, uh, so, so we, we have evidence that the, the lifetimes of disks are affected by their environment. We also have evidence that the masses, um, and this is related to the lifetime, are affected by the environment too. So here what they've got, is that this is a star cluster called Sigma Orionis. There is a massive star here. And what they're doing is um, asking how do the properties of the disks, how, how does the mass of the disks around the stars change as you get further and further away? Um, and so they, they, they're sort of doing an averaging over angles here. And just saying, as I get further away from that big star, as I draw a line along here and add up all the stars in a loop, how massive are the disks? And, and what they claim here is as you get further away, the masses go up. So this is used to, to say, oh look, when you're in this horrible environment near the massive star, with all that horrible ultraviolet light, the disks have less mass than when you're further away and things are a bit calmer. And uh, this is uh, just another example very recently from this year, from like a month or two ago, um, just showing the same sort of thing. They looked at a great big cluster of stars, and uh, this is how massive the, the disks are, um, and this is how horrible the UV field is, the ultraviolet light. So this is very, very strong. This is sort of in the solar neighborhood near the, near the sun, so very calm, and the masses are clearly going down um, as you go into horror, more and more harsh environments. So lifetimes look like they're affected by environment, Masses of the disk of the planet forming disks look like they're affected by environment. And the worst part of the day, there's <laughs> a few of them, um, is that the radii look like uh, they're affected too of the disk. So the sizes. So these are um, sort of probability distributions of how big disks are. So if this means nothing to you, where there is a steep gradient here, that's where that, that's, that tells you the, the sort of size of most of the disks. So in lupus, this nice calm environment, we, we look at the steepest part, and this tells us that most disks are what? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 ages in size. 50 times the distance of the Earth orbiting the Sun. And so in Taurus, it's something like 60 AU. This region here, this red one, is the Orion Nebula Cluster. That one I just showed you a second ago with uh, this thing here, right? This is, the, this is the Orion Nebula Cluster, this region. Um, the Orion Nebula Cluster is the same age as Taurus and Lupus, roughly. But if we look at this plot, the disks are systematically smaller. They're 10, 15 AU, instead of 50, 60. So what, what I'm trying to say with all of these, these plots, and I've summarised in the cartoon here, is there is loads of evidence now that if you take one of these planet-forming disks and you shine ultraviolet light on it, you lower its mass, we see some statistical trends showing that, 
and you make it smaller, which is what that previous disk is doing, <coughs> and you reduce the disk's lifetime. Okay. So, does anyone have any questions at this point? If not, the thing I have not yet commented on at all really is how does this affect the planet formation? And this is something that um, had not been looked at until now, basically, in, in this storm. But, yep. Uh, so, when you showed us the simulation with the cat pads in the University of Exeter, yes. what was the time scale there? So, the, that would be of order, uh, I'd want to say something like half a million, million years. Um, you know, the, well, typical disk lifetimes, so I showed you quite a few, a few slides ago of, of how many disks you have um, as a function of age. Typical di disk lifetimes are a few million years. Right. Um, but there's a, an important thing is that uh, you know, the star formation process is ongoing. So that could have even been longer, actually, sure. that, that simulation. It could have been more like, more like a few million years. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, how might this affect the planet formation? And I'll, I want to preface this by saying I write a lot of grant applications to get money to do research on this topic. And one of the things I was asked a lot is, well, you know, this affects the outer disk, um, you know, where there's not much, where, where uh, you know, the stuff isn't as gravitationally bound to the star. But all the planets are finding are close in. That's what I showed you on like slide five or something, a bunch of really compact planets. So why do we care? Um, so what I'm going to do now with the demo, hopefully, is tell you a little bit about an idea called pebble accretion, um, which is one of the most popular planet formation ideas, and which really could be affected by this um, uh, this process of the disk being shone upon by the environment. So just just to give the technical term for the, for what I've been talking about, it's external photoevaporation. So external meaning that it's something happening to the disk from the outside, and photoevaporation sort of referring to that it being light. You know, evaporating the disk, stripping material away. So, what is pebble accretion? So, this is this is some of the work Lynn, Lynn Chow has been doing. So, um, in planet forming disks, we have dust. We've seen some images of that. These are sort of grains of sand. Actually, these little blobs of play-doh are too big. Um, they're they're really sort of micron size when when they're when they start from the cloud. And then when they make it into the disk, they they start to bump into each other and grow. And it's as simple as just little, little particles bumping, and if you're, if you're not colliding too fast, that you smash apart, they'll just collide and stick, and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what happens is eventually, the particles get big enough that they start to feel um, a drag. So the, the particles, the dust, the solids, will always orbit at, Kep at Keplerian speed, so according to Kepler's laws, okay? But the gas in the disk, actually it orbits a little bit slower because it's got some pressure from the other gas that supports it. So basically, as the particle gets bigger and bigger, it feels more and more gas sort of slapping it in the face, and eventually that becomes a powerful enough effect that it causes it to drift inwards. Okay? So the dust gets bigger, but then it doesn't stay where it is. It goes inwards and, you know, if nothing stops it, it'll fall onto the star. And this process happens quickest in the inner disk because things orbit quickly near the star and slowly out there. So in here, things bump into each other pretty quickly, and they will fall into the star, fall into the star. But here I've got a planet, a, a, you know, a, a planet seed that is trying to become a planet. And so we have what's called a growth front of dust, um, you know, report, uh, that's sort of getting to a, a drifting side and moving in. And eventually that will overtake the planet, and now as the dust starts to stick and drift, not all of it, but some of it will land on the planet and get captured and make it bigger. That's, that's pebble accretion. Pebbles get bigger, they, they start to feel this headwind, they drift inward and stick to the planet, and that happens from the inside outwards. And we grow a bigger and bigger and bigger planet. And so this is a new demo, so it's probably gonna not work that well, but or it's gonna be slightly chaotic, because I need in some in a minute someone to be external photo evaporation incarnate and help me with this demo. Do I have any volunteers? Or else I have to select someone? <laughs> so yeah, pebble accretion has happened in this disk. This was in a calm, lupus-like environment and has made us a planet of a certain size. Do you want to come out? Yeah. Now, are you destructive or constructive? I like to be constructive. You can be constructive. But uh, I can destroy some. 
Um, okay, um, so what we're going to do now, and as I said, I have no idea what's going to happen here. <laughs> um, I'll let you be disruptive. So hold off for a minute. This is a leaf blower. Um, so what we're going to do is have a race. I'm going to give myself a bit of a head start because I'm not going to build anything. You're going to, right, I'm going to come here. If you come around there and like edge on, what you want to do is have the blower like this and destroy it from the outside inwards, right? So you're going to be turning it on and, you know, just going like this. Try, try not to go blur. Yeah. You know, just, just like uh, gradually destroying the disc. And uh, we'll have a race. So, three, two, one, go. <laughs> so I'm going to get in trouble off the cleaners. So I'm going to uh, clear up afterwards. So, why did the planet formation care? Well, uh, when it was in a calm environment, it got all the solids in the disk that were going to make it onto the planet. Whereas in this case, I hope they're actually noticeably different. They are. Um, in this case, um, you know, you're destroying the material that would have made it onto the planet. Okay. And I'm, I can dig up some other material on this, it wasn't in my plan, but we're going a bit quicker than, than I expected. What, what becomes really important is the nature of star formation. We saw in the star formation simulator earlier that you have a bubble blowing that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, the planet you end up with actually depends on when that disk starts getting evaporated. So we've got another, another instance of this in our little competition here. I've tried to make these as similar in mass as possible um, in terms of like the amount of Play-Doh. So what can happen is when a, when a planet forming disk is born, it is always born surrounded by stuff, surrounded by like a natal cloud. It never just starts off immediately getting zapped to hell like it happened just there. It will start off inside a cloud and then eventually the massive stars will either disperse that envelope or maybe they'll just move around, stuff stars, you know, migrate around in star clusters, they don't just sit still. So, again, this probably, uh, I maybe should have some scales or something to do this in the future, but what we're going to do now is the same exercise, but I'm going to give myself a, a five second head start. So you can be destructive again, and so what we're simulating now is that the, the, this, this particular star and its disk have formed in a cloud, and they um, have some time before they start getting zapped. So hold off, one, two, three, Four, five, go. Well, I lost some from my clumsiness, but you should hopefully see, and the scales would have been nice to illustrate this, I'm keeping that one, um, that there should be a bit of a gradient in science here. Okay, so we've got our, thank you very much. <laughs> so the mass of our planet that was in a calm environment is bigger than our mass of our planet that was shielded for a little while that still got zapped a bit is bigger than our mass of our planet where the disk just got instantly zapped. So that's the whole idea of like the next 15 slides, so maybe we'll just skip them. <laughs> I think the demo works sufficiently well. So this is what Lynn Chow has been doing in her research. And um, I think maybe the one thing we will <coughs> just quickly note is to, to sort of formally say what we just saw, the planet, the, the sort of reservoir, the amount of mass of material you have to feed your planet depends on a competition that we don't actually understand very yet, very well yet. The competition between how quickly material grows and drifts inwards, and how quickly the disk gets destroyed. That, that is not well understood, and that's sort of an, an area of research that, that I'm interested in now. So, so, yeah, so if you have very quick growth and drift, and slow destruction of the disk, you get a big planet, um, whereas if you have slow growth and drift and, and quick destruction, you get a small planet. Um, so in my, my original question when I started the talk was, why are planets so diverse? Well, the, the whole thing that I sort of get funded to do in my research is understand the role environment plays. And as of this year, we're now starting to show it matters. Okay. The, in, in a disk, though, you don't normally get one planet. You get multiple planets. Yes. So presumably this effect is much greater on the outer planets than the inner ones. So in the this particular work, we didn't look at that, but there has been other work. So, so, so another thing that happens, which we will look at in a second, is that planets also migrate. So if they get big enough, and I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on this, but if they get big enough, their interaction with the surrounding disk can cause them to move. And um, so you can have things like if, 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 a, if a giant planet formed out here and was trying to migrate inwards, you could have maybe overtake it and leave it stranded out there. And stuff like this. So, um, yeah, you'd expect that generally it's going to affect the outermost planets first. But if you had a chain of terrestrial planets, um, you know, uh, it's not entirely clear to me how, mu how much like a bunch of low-mass planets starve 
like inner planets of, of, of the dust. I think that the, when radio drift is happening with this dust, I think it isn't going to be halted by an Earth. It's going to just keep going right the way through. If you put like a Jupiter in close in, it would starve every other planet inside of the material. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to demonstrate that environment matters. I think, but there are so many other things you know, <laughs> that, that can give planet diversity as well. So yeah, multiple planets. They can scatter each other. They can, um, you know, um, dynamically interact. There's all there's all sorts of other, other factors that go in. This is certainly just one of them. Um, but one that's not that you, you're missing if you look in Lucas is cool. So uh, let's have a look at uh, this sort of a little bit more formally with some of the plots from Lynn's paper. So this is uh, our planet seed, our initial lump of Play-Doh at different radii in the disk. And this is a, a planet form disk that was shone immediately by a fairly strong UV field. And um, I should point out that in, in each simulation there's just one planet in, in, at this, this time. You have to start somewhere, right? We can look at multiple planets next. In fact, that's what Lynn is actually doing. Um, so you know, one model would be just this planet here. Dust strides are coming and it grows. So this is the mass of the planet, and this is where it is. So this one would grow in mass, and eventually do this thing I just said, which is migrate, so it can move in mass. And um, so you see, you don't get any planets far out in this case, when you're instantly just trying to destroy the disk, and the planets further out only grow a little bit. And what we're going to do now is shield, so give, give the planets more of a head start, like in that third case. And you can see that the planets get more and more massive. And you're also starting to get planets further and further out. And you know, some of these planets in the middle here can actually start to migrate inwards. So this one did nothing before, but now you've got a sort of 0.3 Earth mass planet quite close in. So th and this is just shielding the, the disk for a little while. Um, and then this is um, just, just doing a comparison. So if you put a planet seed at 25 AU, so 25 the distance, times the distance of the Earth from the Sun, um, this is how massive the planet would be. Um, depending on how long you shield the disk for. And then the different colours are how strong the radiation is you're shining on the disk. So this is quite weak, the blue. It doesn't care. You, you know, nothing really happens to the planets. This is what you find in Taurus. And then we, we go up and up and up in the UV field strip. And the really interesting thing here, I think, is um, the amount of time you can hide a disk for in the first million years has a massively nonlinear effect on the planet you get. You know, you, um, Half a million years of shielding takes you from like, what is this, about the moon or something, to um, the tenth of the Earth. Um, so there's a, a massive sensitivity to what happens early on, which is maybe a bit worrying um, in terms of trying to understand things. You know, it gets very messy early on. We, we don't know what the initial conditions of a disk are. We, we don't know if this starts small or big. Um, but yes, uh, just, just to sort of illustrate one of the scenarios that Lynn um, got from those models. Uh, so this is from that previous plot. There is, there is one case where with no shielding at all, she would find the moon in her model. Um, it's somewhere between the orbit of Uranus and Neptune. And then if she takes exactly the same model and shields it for one million years, she gets an Earth. You know, one Earth mass planet of one, one AU from the Sun. So this is uh, yeah, making a massive difference, this, this shielding and then this evaporation on the planets that you get. So, I'm going to wrap up there and just say that if you, if you don't take anything else away from this talk, um, I think the, the key message is that planet formation um, is, is sensitive to this, this star forming environment. Star formation and planet formation are connected. That hasn't been appreciated for quite a few years in, in, in the community, but really is starting to become um, more widely spoken about now. Um, and Lynn is starting to show the kind of planets you get really do depend on uh, when and how much you like the disks you're exposed to. And uh, finally, and it's already been sort of mentioned with a couple of the questions, there is so much to do here, you know, really just scratching the surface. Um, a lot of this work's theoretical, we need the observations to prove it, uh, but there's still top of that tons of theoretical work to do too. So um, I've got uh, at least three more years on my Royal Society Fellowship, I have an ERC grant starting soon, so I have a big team, and there's also going to be um, undergraduate and ERC projects on this topic too, including Possibly something looking at looking at some of this, uh, looking at some of this data. So I'll stop there. And does anyone have any questions? Presumably, those massive stars don't have a disk of their own because they've already blown that away. So they don't get any planets. Is that uh, true? That's a very uh, insightful point. Um, 
They do, and they need one, because otherwise how do you make them? Um, so there, there's been a problem in astronomy for years of how do you make a massive star, because once it gets massive enough, the radiation pressure it exerts on the, if, if you just had a spherically collapsing cloud, once it gets sufficiently bright, it would just blow away all the gas. Um, so actually the solution to that seems to be, um, if, if it has a disk, most of the energy just escapes out the poles and you can still get material close in enough to the star accreting. So they do, they do have disks, and we've actually, in, again, in the last five years, started to see them. Um, but yeah, how long they last, kind of, I don't think it's that long known. And um, yes, they're extremely bright and extremely you know, um, energetic and shining harshly on these inner disks, but the disks are also incredibly gravitationally bound when they get close, so that it's quite hard to disperse them. Um, but, you know, the massive stars explode after five million years, so we don't really think about planets in that case so much. Any other questions? Yeah. So if um, we're saying that our local environment is relatively unusual mm. in the sense that the star clusters are small and, and absent large stars, mm. does that make you Earth somewhat unique or more unique relative to, to an, a an average kind of planet wandering around? Yeah. An Bear in mind that the Earth is, uh, well, actually, I've forgotten the age of the Earth, but you know, billions of years old, and it was something like 14 million years ago that supernova went off, and we, we sort of uh, just now are sitting at the middle of this uh, this this bubble. So yes, our environment now is calm, but that doesn't mean it was at the time of planet formation, of the Earth formation. And actually, it's worth noting that this is a, a massive area of ongoing debate: is did the did the Earth form in a massive cluster, or did it form in a, in a kind of calm, low mass environment? And um, the, the, a lot of the debate there is to do with things called short-lived radionuclides, so like are the D26 and certain types of, of iron that we find in asteroids. And those short-lived radionuclides were thought for a while to only really be produced from supernovae. So the argument was, oh, we have these things in our asteroids, so we must have formed in a big cluster near a massive star because it exploded and enriched our solar system. But it turns out, actually, because there's so many supernovae going off, you can just sort of leave some lying around. Uh, so so that, that angle, you know, it, it's, it's still really debated what, where did our solar system form. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a particularly conclusive, uh, you know, not, there's no consensus on what the answer is there. Um, because we're not finding any solar systems that look like ours, we can't say it mm. must be like that. Yes, well, um, but yeah, I mean, it's mostly because of biases. We should do soon. So there's the Plato mission launching in uh, two years, I think, 2026, which is going to find, it's going to be looking for long enough to, to find some sort of Earth-like planets at one of you, is the idea. They might find a few, I think, is that it's, it's not that they're not there, it's our biases in yeah. finding them. Any other questions? I've got to say, you're looking remarkably awake for 10 to 6 on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> okay, um, there's no more then. Yeah, there are no more questions and we can end the session here. Uh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Hayward, for providing us with your time and uh, graciously accepting our request to share this lecture here. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, like, Dr. Thoma, uh, like Dr. Hayward said, we will be uh, increasing our collaboration with the department as well. and hosting many more events, like you suggested. So uh, do keep uh, updating yourself on the sites of group chat, and we'll be posting more events soon. Thank you, everyone. I've been Thank you. Thank you.